Part 1 Hear a conversation between a travel agent and a customer. The customer wants to book a coach ticket. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully. Good morning. I'd like to book a coach to London. I was hoping you had something available this Saturday afternoon. Good morning, sir. Take a seat and I'll just check for you. Uh, yes. We still have several free seats for Saturday. Where will you be leaving from? There are three pick-up points in town, Main Street, Centenary Square or the Central Bus Station. From Centenary Square, please. That's easier for me to get to than the bus station. And what time would you like to leave? There are coaches on the hour every hour, from 12 through till 6pm. Well, I'm meeting someone at the station in London, and I need to be there for 4.30. So, which one would you recommend? Hmm. Well, there's one leaving at 1 that arrives at Victoria Station at 4.10, if that's any good. Traffic is usually quite light at the weekend, and the drivers tend to make good time, so I think you'd certainly be there for 4.30. OK. That sounds just right. I think I'll take that. I can always phone ahead if I'm going to be late. And when are you returning, sir? Actually, I'm not sure when I'll be coming back, so I won't book a return ticket, just one way. I can always book you an open return if you'd like. You can use this at any time within the next month, as long as you contact us first to reserve a seat. Well, there's a chance I might be getting a lift back, you see. So I'll just pay for one way. I don't want to buy a return if I don't need it. OK, no problem. Are you travelling alone? Just the one ticket, please. I'm going down to visit my daughter at university. My son's meeting me at the station, so it's a proper family reunion. Very nice. OK, well, I can book that for you if you like, sir. That'll be £23.50. Now, I just need to take down some details. Can I have your name, please? Yes, it's Matthew Upton. That's U-P-T-O-N. And your address? 34 Allersley Road. Allersley. That's A-L-L-E-S-L-E-Y. And your telephone number? 01732 558 997. And your email address? We'll use this to send confirmation of your travel details. Matt257 at yahoo.co.uk OK, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Before I forget, I'll be taking a little luggage. Is there a set luggage allowance? We offer a very good luggage allowance. You can take two suitcases as long as they're no more than 20 kilos each. That's 40 kilos in total and one small item of hand luggage on the coach. Most people find that more than adequate. Any additional items carry an extra charge of £10 for each bag. I certainly won't be taking that much, so I should be OK. 
I was worried I might be taking too much. Would you like travel insurance included with your ticket? It's an additional two pounds. No, I don't think so. No problem. It's not compulsory. Okay. How will you be paying? Actually, I've been having trouble with my debit card today, and I've left my checkbook at home, so I'd better pay in cash. You'll give me a receipt, won't you? Certainly, and we'll send confirmation to your email address as well. So that's twenty-three pounds fifty, sir. If you just wait a minute, I'll print you off a receipt. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Listen to the whole survey in the correct order and answer the questions. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully.、Uh, excuse me. Good morning. We're students from Saint Anne's School, and we're doing a class survey. Have you got five minutes to answer a few questions? Uh, I suppose so. What are the questions about? About spending habits, people's attitudes to money, and what they spend money on. Well, yes. Okay, but only five minutes. Thank you. Okay. First of all, if you don't mind answering, what income band are you in? You just need to say low, average, or high. Oh, that's difficult to say.、Uh, I don't know how much everyone else makes. <laughs> I'm certainly not poor, but I'm not rich either. Certainly not after I've paid all my bills. Shall we say in the middle then? Yes, I think so. And how much money do you feel you have to spend? You said that you have to pay a lot of bills. Yes, I feel that I don't have very much. I earn quite good money, but it doesn't feel like that most of the time. I guess everyone would like to have a bit more money, though. Okay, so what do you spend most of your money on? Well, most of it goes on monthly expenses. I've got a big mortgage on my house, and my children's school fees are very high. After I've paid for gas and electricity and water and all the insurance on the house and my car, I don't have much left. I like taking my wife out to a nice restaurant once a month, but I don't very often buy clothes. Oh, and I collect radios, <laughs> old radios. That's my hobby. And how do you usually pay for the things you buy? I use my debit card for most things these days. I have two credit cards, but I don't like using them. I prefer to pay for things immediately. Otherwise, I feel I'm getting into debt. I pay my bills online or over the telephone. I usually have between ten and twenty pounds in cash with me to pay for emergencies, taxi fares, and that kind of thing. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. What do you think is good value for money? Hmm, not very much to tell you the truth. 
Everything seems to cost more than it should these days. I think my telephone and internet broadband package is good value for money, though. That's my telephone line, any number of national calls, and unlimited internet use for only £22 a month. I think at least one member of my family is online for an hour or more every day. I think £22 is a very good deal. And what do you think is a waste of money? Personally, I don't understand why anyone buys a new car. They are so expensive, and as soon as you drive them out of the showroom, they're worth £3,000 less. Perhaps I'm just saying it because I can't afford a new car myself, but to me, it seems so much more sensible to buy a good second hand car for half the money. Do you ever buy anything you can't afford? <laughs> yes, I collect radios, old radios. I have nine now, and they're quite expensive. I paid £350 for a 1950s radio last month. I didn't have much money for the rest of the month after that. My wife thinks I'm crazy, but it's important to treat yourself occasionally, don't you think? My wife buys nice perfume and lots of clothes, and I have my radios. OK, so finally, would you say that you're a spender or a saver? Well, as I said, I don't really have much to save, but I guess I'm a saver rather than a spender. It's good to enjoy money if you have it, but you must save for a rainy day. You never know what will happen in the future. Thank you very much for talking to us. Have a nice day now. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a student, Kayana, and a professor about an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hi, Dr. Reed. Are you busy right now? Do you mind if I come in for a second? Hey, Kiana. No, I don't mind at all. Thanks. I just wanted to say that I'm enjoying your Urban Studies course and that I'm having some trouble with the first assignment. OK, no problem. What do you want to ask? This is my first time writing a paper of this length. All right. What sort of trouble are you running into? Well, writing more than 10 pages is actually turning out to be quite a task. I've been rereading some of the material, and I'm just not sure how to approach the assignment. Yes, it takes some time to get used to academic writing assignments. More time than I expected, really. I also want to do a really good job on the assignment. I don't want to put a half-hearted effort into it. I'm glad to hear that. I'll say that these assignments get easier to manage as time goes on. That's a small relief. I mean, it gets easier to plan the assignment and to organise one's time, but it still takes hard work and a sincere effort to produce a good piece of academic writing. My role is to guide you to the readings I think are the most relevant and to give you tips on managing your time. OK. Could we talk about the readings then? Sure. We can go over them. I guess I want to ask about the Cole House text first. It seems like a pretty interesting book. But sometimes a bit over the top, no? I would recommend reading just the first part of the book. It's the most relevant to the assignment that I gave you. The rest of the text goes on about a topic we will cover later in the semester. All right, I'll just read the intro then. As for the Peely article, oh, did you read that one? 
Yes, I accessed it online and then printed it out. Okay. I would recommend you review that again. Also, remember what I said about the Liebskid article? I think you told the class to focus on the research methods, right? Yes. She approaches the problem in an innovative way. Let's see. For the Gary article, I think you should. Let me see. I think it would be best for you to read just the conclusion. Just the conclusion? I see. Yes, I would ask you to read the whole thing, but this way would be more efficient. Speaking of which, you should not bother reading the Wolfson article. Yeah, it didn't seem particularly relevant to the topic. Let's see. Any other reading you wanted to talk about? Let me see. Um, yes, the Cuddler article. What do you think of that one? Ah, yes. How could I forget? That one is pretty central to the topic. I really think you must go over it again. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to ask about? Yes, I wanted to ask about the line graph that you provided. It seems that the legend identifying the different parts is not there. Ah, it must not have been photocopied correctly. Here, let me explain them. They all represent percentages of the population in Manassas, OK? Line 1 here at the top is the percentage of people who were born in a foreign country. Born outside the country. OK, and this one? The next line down, line 2 refers to the percentage of people with citizenship. All right, got it. Those making a middle class wage are represented by the fifth line down. OK, middle class wage earners. And the line number 4? That is the percentage of people with a college education or higher. All right, and the one in the middle? That one is the percentage of population who are married and have children. Got it. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. I really appreciate your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture on international trade, I'm going to look at the issue of protectionism. I'll start off with a definition of protectionism and then go on to look at the methods countries have used to protect their economy. Following this, I'll look at the advantages and disadvantages of protectionism when compared to free and open trade. So let's define protectionism. Protectionism at its simplest is the opposite of free trade. It is the practice of protecting domestic industries from foreign competition by using import duties or quotas. 
options available to protect the economy are tariffs, embargoes, subsidies, and quotas. Let's examine these in turn with some examples. Tariffs are one form of protectionism. It is a tax which is applied to imported goods, but not to home-produced goods. The idea is to make the imported goods more expensive than the home-produced ones, so that consumers buy home-produced items. An ongoing example of protectionism via tariff is between Britain and the USA. Britain buys most of its bananas from Commonwealth countries, largely in the Caribbean. However. The USA owns banana plantations in South America. In 1999, Britain refused to buy bananas from South America, so the U.S. government put tariffs on some British-produced goods. The most famous example was a tariff of 100% import tax on wool products from Scotland brought into the United States. The next method of protectionism is embargoes. An embargo. Is a complete ban on the import of certain goods. For example, following the Cuban Revolution in the 1950s, the USA banned the import of Cuban cigars. Unfortunately, Cuban cigars are the finest in the world, and there is consequently a thriving black market in Cuban cigars in the USA. As we can see in the example, embargoes can lead to a black market or unofficial economy. If people want the goods badly enough, subsidies are a way governments support industries at home with money or tax breaks, in order to allow them to compete better with foreign companies. In 1994, the French government provided its national airline with a two billion pound subsidy, in order to help it compete with low cost airlines. However. Subsidies can have the effect of making home producers uncompetitive and inefficient. Finally, let's look at quotas. A quota system allows a certain quantity of goods to be imported from other countries. The European Union has had quotas on textiles and clothing for decades to protect its textile industries from developing countries, especially India and China. Understandably. Developing countries say that this is unfair and against the principles of free trade. Let's move on now to the arguments for and against protectionism. For trade to flourish between countries, the benefits from trade need to be equally balanced. Where a country feels that it's not getting a fair share of the trade, or that it is somehow disadvantaged. It might employ one or more of the methods of protection. There are at least four arguments that may be given for using protectionism. Firstly, to protect employment in the home country. The simple view is that if imports are stopped, then jobs will be saved and even created at home. Secondly, to prevent unfair competition. It is often said that developing countries have the advantage of cheap labour costs in their countries, and that they use this to undercut the price of the same goods produced in richer nations. A tariff might be applied to even out this imbalance. Thirdly, to protect new industries, a new industry, particularly one in a developing country, might not be able to compete with long-established industries elsewhere. Tariffs and quotas give new industries the chance to build up production to the point where they can compete. Fourthly, to raise money, tariffs were once used as a way of raising revenue for the government. In modern countries, they are now seldom used for this purpose, as the damage to trade often outweighs any immediate benefits. Now for the arguments against protectionism, which are perhaps simpler to summarize. Although trade restrictions might help a country for a short period of time, their overall effect is a negative one. Restrictions affect the flow of trade, and the more countries employ restrictions, the less trade can flow. In the long run, no one benefits from trade restriction because if one country puts restrictions on another country, the other country then puts their own restrictions on the first country. This affects the first country's exports. And as the country finds it difficult to export goods, then unemployment is the result. So protection 
tends to help only the protected and can hide inefficient manufacturers. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.